Welcome to today's lecture. Last week we spoke about the different duties and responsibilities of central banks and we saw that in many countries central banks also act as the supervisory authority and in Germany it's slightly different. Uh, there are some countries where in fact the central bank uh, is also the supervisory agency. Does anyone know an example for a country in which the central bank also acts as the supervisory agency? More or less? Anyone here from France? No? Yeah? Okay. So, uh, how is regulation and supervision done in France? No idea. Uh, the Banque de France is the central bank, obviously, and the agency that is um, responsible for the supervision of the financial market is, ever heard of this, the uh, ACPR, the ACPR? I think it's the Agence pour, it's ACPR. AC, no, P. Ag the agency for the control and prudential for um, uh, agence de control prudentiel et de régulation. So for prudential, for prudential control of the financial sector and for regulation. And actually, the ACPR is part of the French National Central Bank. And this is an example for a country in which supervision is actually done by the central bank. In Germany, we have a slightly different system. We have a supervisory um, agency um, with the BaFin that is responsible for the supervision of the financial market, but it um, cooperates with Deutsche Bundesbank, the central bank, when it comes to the supervision of the banking sector. For insurance companies and for the stock exchange, only BaFin is responsible for the supervision of these sectors, but when it comes to banking, uh, Deutsche Bundesbank as a central bank is also involved, together of course with the European Central Bank. In Germany, most of these um, responsibilities um, are laid out in the KWG, the um, Kreditwesengesetz, the German Banking Act. And uh, here, for example, um, you see paragraph six, um, and this is where we uh, stopped last time. Uh, actually, I should have translated this as well. This is in German Absatz. This is paragraph. Uh, so, um, yeah. Um, in section six of the German Banking Act, it says that BaFin is responsible for the supervision of the financial sector, and BaFin may take uh, any action that is suitable and necessary. Uh, to regulate and to supervise financial institutions and to ensure the safety of the financial sector. So this is the general, the general section in the KWG that uh, allows um, and lays out the responsibilities and is of course the duties um, and the instruments um, BaFin has to control the financial sector and to uh, supervise institutions. It goes on. In the next part of this uh, um, law, here in uh, uh, paragraph 6, in exercising its functions, BaFin shall duly consider the potential impact of its decisions on the stability of the financial system in the EA states concerned. Actually, this was introduced later on. Of course, the German Banking Act is much older. It dates back to um, shortly after, um, the, um, after the war. And, uh, of course, at that time, um, no one in Germany cared about uh, regulation on a European level because the European Union uh, had not been founded yet. But later on, um, especially after the financial crisis, um, we have included more and more sections uh, in our laws, especially in the German Banking Act, um, that uh, financial stability also at a European level is also one of the things BaFin should look at when um, regulating and supervising financial institutions in Germany. Yeah? Uh, what does the A standard EA call? Uh, what is it? E uh, no, no, area. It's the Europäische Wirtschaftsgemeinschaft, IWG. So it's not exactly the European Union, but in fact it's the part um, 
it's um, the other union of European countries um, that um, is concerned with uh, the joint uh, market and economic economy. Okay. Um, I've already told you that BaFin and Deutsche Bundesbank cooperate and are more or less um, well, they're expected to cooperate when it comes to the supervision of the banking sector. And this is laid out here in this part of the Banking Act. BaFin and Deutsche Bundesbank will cooperate as stipulated in this Act without prejudice to further legal provisions. This cooperation encompasses the ongoing supervision of institutions by the Deutsche Bundesbank. Um, in German, this is called Laufende Überwachung. Uh, so this means this is the regular ongoing supervision on a day-to-day -day basis, which is done by Deutsche Bundesbank and more specifically by the local offices, and the regional offices here, the Hauptverwaltung, of which one is here located in Leipzig. And this actually means that um, examiners and supervisors of Deutsche Bundesbank uh, sit in an office in each bank, actually in the large banks, they have regular offices and uh, these examiners and these supervisors will uh, work at, for example, Deutsche Bank, at Commerzbank, uh, 365 days of a year. And they are responsible for the ongoing supervision. And BaFin will only step in in case something goes wrong, in case uh, the supervisors and the examiners of um, um, of Bundesbank uh, notice any illegal uh, activities if they notice something is going wrong uh, BaFin will step in and they will be included in uh, irregular examinations so this is the ongoing supervision of institutions by the Deutsche Bundesbank ongoing supervision notably entails evaluating the documentation submitted by institutions audit reports pursuant to section 26 annual financial statements and this is more or less um, the work that is also done by CPAs as you know um, all companies or public companies have to file their annual reports and these have to be audited by CPAs. In German, actually, we are not calling them uh, CPAs. In German, they are called Wirtschaftsprüfer, um, VPs, hmm? WP, stand for Wirtschaftsprüfer, the German word for CPA. And the CPAs, of course, have to audit every company, every public company, and they will audit and testify that the annual reports are correct. Now, for um, financial institutions, of course, CPAs also have to do this um, to inform the sh uh, shareholders and stakeholders that the annual reports are correct. But, of course, supervision and uh, government supervision is close to and closely related to this uh, sort of audit. But, of course, um, the um, state uh, examiners uh, and the state supervisors, they um, look at different questions. They look at capital requirements, they look at uh, the way the um, company is doing business, and uh, this is what they do, and the ongoing supervision entails audit reports and uh, auditing the financial statements. If you go to the United States, um, actually you can find uh, parts and even um, the full um, statutory reports of banks in the in on the internet. Um, most of these reports that have to be filed with the supervisory agency, in Germany at least, they're not public. So uh, most of the things uh, banks report to BaFin and Deutsche Bundesbank, they are confidential. In other countries, there are laws in place that stipulate that banks have to, um, have to publish and have to disclose the statutory reports and the statutory filings to the supervisory agency. So if you take, for example, Citibank or Bank of America, you will find an official annual report that is published for shareholders, and you will also find the statutory filings with the SEC and with the FDIC or with the FED. And there you can find more information on uh, things that are related to supervision, that are uh, connected with um, financial stability, uh, but usually these statutory filings are much less uh, visually attractive as the annual reports. The annual reports, you have nice fancy pictures and uh, graphs. Um, the uh, statutory filings will 
usually only include text and sheer numbers that are reported to the financial supervisory agency. Okay, so this is um, the general rule. The ongoing supervision is done by Deutsche Bundesbank and BaFin will only step in with banks at least um, in case uh, something is uh, out of the ordinary. Okay. What are the usual instruments and tasks of a financial supervisory agency? Usually, and you can see some examples from German law, um, the supervisory agency will use capital requirements to force banks to hold more capital and to stabilize the financial sector. Um, what is the general idea behind capital requirements with banks? Why do supervisors usually resort to higher capital requirements as a major instrument in financial supervision and regulation. Any idea? What is the mechanism behind capital requirements? Any idea? What does it mean, capital requirement? It is with a simple look at a balance sheet of a bank. A balance sheet of a bank will look like this. You have assets on the asset side, debt and equity. Well, what could go wrong? Yes. Uh, are they trying to protect themselves like bankruptcy? Or? Yes. What, let's start with the view from the supervisory agency. The worst case scenario for the supervisor is that one bank will fail and because of many different reasons, the problems at one bank could spill over to another bank and then a large portion of the banking sector will default and this default of a massive number of banks will have an impact on the um, asset portfolios of institutional holdings, it will impact the stock market and it could um, seriously destabilize um, financial trans transaction and payment systems. So in the end, if for example all banks go bankrupt, we would have the problem that we would know as households we would no longer be able uh, to make our regular payments and economic growth and economic activity would be severely impaired. So you have to make sure that banks do not default. At least the, um, the process of banks defaulting needs to be controlled and needs to be supervised. A bank can default, that is not a problem, but if a bank becomes too large, if it is too big to fail, if you have to fear that the problems at one bank will spill over to other banks, you as a supervisory agency, have, uh, you have to step in. Now, you have to make sure that Selected institutions cannot default so easily. So how do you make sure that banks do not default? When will default happen? If you look at the balance sheet, when will default happen? If you are not able to pay your debt, if you are not able to, if you have, do not have enough liquidity um, to pay your bills that come in on a regular basis. Okay. This is the immediate reason why a bank or a company will default. Um, what is another reason, perhaps a more theoretical reason, if you look at the balance sheet? If, you're, if your equity is depleted and your leverage is too high. Usually you have a problem when you are too highly levered. If leverage is too high and, and how can leverage become too high? Uh, leverage is simply debt over equity and this relation between debt and equity, if this relation, if the leverage ratio becomes uh, too unhealthy for you as a company, uh, you're close to bankruptcy and you're close to default. So what could the supervisory agency do? It can force you to decrease debt and to decrease liabilities well, that is usually a problem. Um, decreasing liabilities uh, 
um, how can you decrease liabilities? You cannot simply say, oh, I'm not, if you, you could decrease, um, decrease your liabilities by uh, telling your investors, well, I'm no longer paying back the money. But in that case, you are defaulting. So the only thing you can do is what? Increase equity. And equity is almost equivalent to capital. Capital is, is uh, a word, is a synonym for um, equity, but usually we are speaking of regulatory capital. And what is the difference between regulatory capital and equity? There's a fine distinction between the two. Equity is just equity from the balance sheet. But there are also some parts on, um, in the liabilities uh, some debt parts of the balance sheet that can be treated almost as if they were equity. And why? What is the defining distinction between debt and equity? That your debt you pay interest on a regular basis. Yeah. Another difference. It's 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 caused by. Uh, the fact that as a creditor you get interest and as uh, a shareholder you get the residual revenue. It's the preferential treatment of debt over equity in case of default. If you are a creditor, if you have given out um, money and capital to this bank and it defaults, you will be among the first to get some money back out of the proceeds in case the company is liquidated. So you have a preferential treatment of debt over equity and shareholders will be the last ones who might get one buck back from their investment. And because of this preferential treatment, of course, um, the shareholders have a larger stake in the company and there are some parts of, uh, the, of the company's debt that can be treated as equity, although uh, it's legally it's not debt. Do you know any uh, examples for um, debt positions that can be treated as equity when it comes to the view of the supervisory agency, to the regulator? Something like the cocoa bonds? Cocoa bonds, convertible bonds. Does everyone know what a convertible bond is? A bond is debt. It's a liability. I'm a bank now and I need to raise capital. I need to raise money. What can I do? I can ask all of you to become a shareholder or I could simply uh, issue a bond and you can buy one million in bonds of my bank. And this is simply a loan that has been securitized. That's a bond. Now then what is a convertible bond? I will give out, I will issue bonds, a convertible bond. You can buy the convertible bond and you as a creditor, you as the investor have the right, you do not, you, you have no obligation, but you have to write to do what? To convert something, but what can you convert? You can convert the convertible bond into shares, into equity. And then you switch from being a creditor to being a shareholder. So debt suddenly becomes equity. So a convertible bond, it's also called a hybrid type of, uh, of uh, financing. Um, and in this case, obviously, a convertible bond is closer to equity than a simple bond would be. There is also a construction, an, an instrument called cocoa bond. It's a contingent convertible bond. And a cocoa bond works the other way around. I can issue, as a bank, I can issue a cocoa bond. You can buy this cocoa bond and you start being a creditor. You have debt and you have, uh, I, I've, I've issued debt. Now the contingent convertible bond does not give you the right to switch from bond to equity, but the cocoa bond is automatically um, converted into equity in case a certain trigger is triggered. And a trigger could, for example, be that your leverage ratio is too high and your capital ratio is too low. So 
the, con the cocoa bond, the contingent convertible bond, could, for example, be converted from um, debt to equity in case you are close to bankruptcy. And in this situation, the cocoa bond helps you to increase your capital ratio and you are able to prevent default. Why would I, as a bank, issue a cocoa bond? Because this is a safeguard against default and regulatory uh, agencies like this. Why would you, as an investor, buy a cocoa bond? Because you are forced to switch from being a creditor to being a shareholder in case the company is doing badly. Yeah? Okay. Say again. Yeah, the interest rate is higher, so you're getting paid more interest on the cocoa bond than you would get, for example, on a normal bond. So a cocoa bond, a uh, convertible bond, these are two types of uh, financing that should be treated differently than a regular bank loan, for example. And there are several other types of debt that are not treated as 100% equity, but the regulator and most supervisory agencies uh, have uh, rules in place that tell you as a bank that, for example, this type of liability is considered and enters the calculation of regulatory capital with 10% or 20%. Long-term loans also sometimes are treated um, as almost as equity uh, when calculating regulatory capital. You have a question? Yeah, um, when a bank is close to defaulting, uh, are all cocoa bonds and Depends on the cocoa bond. You can you can you can choose the type of trigger. So the cocoa bonds will usually also have different types of trigger. Yeah. And uh, can they be reversed? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. Also, con uh, convertible bonds can only be switched ones from debt to equity. Yeah. Usually, usually, I would say um, these types of uh, of financing are not actually used to become a shareholder for a long-term investment. You convert the convertible bond at a time where it's uh, beneficial for you, and you will immediately um, make the profit by immediately selling the shares on the stock market. So you are not you are not actually you are not really using a convertible bond to become a, a shareholder with a long term interest in the company. Yeah. Capital requirements. Do you think that higher capital requirements work? Highly controversial. Um, what could now leaving aside all these uh, fine prints and this uh, this uh, complex mechanism of calculating regulatory capital? By the way, regulatory capital in, is then simply equity plus all these additional types of debt that are accepted as near equity by the regulator. So this is why we don't call it equity. Equity is just equity from the balance sheet, but regulatory capital is usually more than equity. And some parts of debt are also accepted as regulatory capital. Now, um, let's assume that regulatory capital is simply equity. What could the bank do to increase its capital ratio, its regulatory capital ratio? What could it do? Simplest way to increase equity is to do a seasoned offering. You can issue new shares and you can try to find new shareholders. Do you think this is, uh, is the usual way banks will go? Not really. In many cases, um, banks will only see the need to increase equity in case they are forced to do so. In case the regulator tells a bank, we've just seen this, for example, you might have uh, heard that uh, 
the FSB, uh, the Financial Stability Board, has just published its new list of financially systemically important banks. And there you have certain groups. For example, uh, JP Morgan is in the second highest group. And then in the third highest group, you have uh, Citigroup, Bank of America, Deutsche Bank. And depending on the question in which group you are, you have to have higher capital. You have to fulfill higher capital requirements. Now, is this something good? Usually not. If the regulator tells you, you as a bank are so systemically important, you are so dangerous to the financial system, and your capital ratio is so low, you have to increase regulatory capital. This is usually a signal to the market. This, this bank is either too dangerous or it's doing not so well. So it's a negative signal to the market. And in this time, when the market thinks that your capital ratio is too low, it's not the best time to do a season offering and to issue new shares because the shareholders will just think, OK, well, this bank is not doing so well. Why should we invest as shareholders in this company? So you can issue new shares, but you will not be able to raise so much capital. And also, raising capital is, of course, costly. So do you have another idea what banks will usually do if they are told by regulators that their capital ratio is too low? Yeah, in English. The Einlagen zu erhöhen. Die Einlagen zu reduzieren, to decrease deposits, usually that's not so efficient. And it's not possible to decrease deposits uh, in this way. The problem usually is that you cannot control the flow of deposits. In that case, you would simply tell all um, offices and all bank branches no longer accept deposits. And this is detrimental to the reputation of the bank. Also, um, it will not really help you because you still, um, what can you do with the deposits? You, you can no longer accept deposits. And this is a very slow process of uh, melting down your balance sheet. What else could you do? Selling your assets and your debts? Yeah, usually this is what is done. You try to melt down both sides of the, um, as of the balance sheet. And the idea actually was correct, uh, but it was on the wrong side of the balance sheet. It's not the deposits that banks will try to decrease, but what do they do? They sell off assets or decrease their assets, and what is the main uh, position on the asset side of the balance sheet? What makes up the largest part of the asset side of a balance sheet of a bank? Yeah, loans. And this is a frequent result in research on the functioning and the um, way capital requirements work. Higher capital requirements often lead to what we call a credit crunch. And this is something that is, has just been shown by colleagues uh, at um, the IWH, uh, the Economic Research Center here in Halle. Um, they have looked at the real effects of higher capital requirements in the European Union after 2011, I think. And what they find is that banks cut down on their lending. If they are forced to hold more capital, um, they do not simply increase their equity, but they cut down on lending, and this forces a credit crunch. And this is, of course, uh, especially um, should be seen especially negatively in the current time of uh, low interest rates because one would think that after the financial crisis, the European Central Bank started to print money and uh, started their quantitative easing program and that by um, increasing money supply, um, banks would be inclined to give out more loans to firms uh, 
firms would be able to create new jobs and economic growth would be spurred. But in fact, this is highly uh, counterproductive and by increasing capital requirements, banks do not simply increase their equity, they simply cut down on lending and they do not give out new loans to firms. And this uh, leads to more stable banks, but a less stable banking sector and a less stable financial sector because suddenly economic growth um, decreases. Yeah. Shouldn't the regulatory agency uh, do an uh, anti so Yes. Yeah. Um, Ideally, yes. Uh, in reality, usually not. What is meant by anti-cyclical or counter-cyclical capital buffers and counter-cyclical capital requirements? Any idea? Yeah? Uh, yeah. Imagine this is the business cycle. You have recessions, you have downturns, you have uh, upturns, you have boom uh, phases. And the way it usually goes is that banks are doing fine and the economy is doing fine and banks cry for help and governments should deregulate the sector. Governments usually concur, they deregulate the financial sector um, bubbles uh, are created and at some point um, you have a deregulated banking sector, you have lower capital requirements and suddenly the economy takes a turn for the worse and banks fail and the usual reaction of the supervisor is, oh banks are failing, we need to raise capital requirements. But by raising capital requirements, the supervisor and the regulator even um, increases this negative effect on the economy. So banks are failing, they're cutting down on lending, supervisors step in, increase capital requirements because they want to stabilize the banking sector. And by um, increasing capital requirements via this channel um, of uh, banks, Cutting, back, uh, cutting down their lending, they even worsen the effect, the real effect on economic growth. And the recession is even worse than it would have been with a different type of regulation. This is a pro-cyclical regulation. So the regulation goes hand in hand with the business cycle, with the economic cycle. So counter-cyclical, after the financial crisis, many, many uh, commentators and many researchers have called for counter-cyclical regulation. And this means that during good times, you increase capital requirements and you start to build capital buffers. And if you notice that actually the economy is going down and banks are having problems, you are able to decrease capital requirements to make life a little bit easier for banks so that can, banks can uh, survive and they can still be active lenders. Mm -hmm. Capital requirements can be found in Section 10 for the German Banking Act. This is a very important instrument and actually the most important instrument supervisors and regulators have. It's usually all about capital, cap, capital, capital. There's one famous German um, economics professor um, who has called many times um, for a regulatory capital ratio of 50%. His argument is, of course, it's a little bit, uh, it's a populist call and a populist view, but he thinks that if all governments would agree on one single very high capital ratio, regulatory capital ratio, we wouldn't have any problems. If all banks were forced to hold, for example, 50% capital, it would be a level playing field for all banks. No bank would have an advantage over another bank uh, and all banks would be stable. This is, of course, a very extreme view, but of course one can argue that this might be possible. And what do you think? What is the usual capital ratio in in these countries in the developed world? Yeah. Five to ten percent. Yeah, usually eight percent, five to ten percent, and this is important to note. If you take if you 
simply take the equity ratio, the, um, the leverage ratio, from the balance sheet of, for example, Deutsche Bank, you will see that Deutsche Bank only has equity, an equity ratio of 1 or 2%. However, its regulatory capital ratio is, of course, above the required ratio, which is, I think, 8%. But this is due to the fact that some debt positions are included in regulatory capital, but the pure balance sheet equity ratio is just 1 or 2%. It's extremely low. Is there a German expression for regulatory capital? Um, yes, regulatorisches Kapital. Regulatorisches Kapital, that's the German word for regulatory capital. One has to say that in English, usually, capital, just the word capital is also used synonymously with regulatory capital. So if you speak of capital uh, in um, connection with banks, it usually means regulatory capital. And one also has to admit that Equity is, of course, the most important part of regulatory capital. Um, you can try to issue cocoa bonds and you can try to, to mix a little bit of debt into your regulatory capital, but usually uh, you have more influence over equity than you have over the debt positions that enter um, regulatory capital. And also, the required, um, it, it's, it's actually quite... Um, sophisticated, the way regulatory capital is um, um, calculated. What you actually do is you look at the asset side of your balance sheet, you look at the risky positions, and then you look at the so-called risk-weighted assets. And the, um, the amount of capital you need is usually calculated, for example, by looking at 8% times risk-weighted assets. Why is this done? There is, of course, you need to make a distinction between two banks. If a bank only held totally risk-free government bonds, this would be a totally different case than, for example, a bond that is only engaged in subprime mortgage loans. So we would assume that this bank, who only holds risk-free government bonds, is 100% stable and uh, without any chance of default, Whereas, of course, the bank who holds mortgage subprime loans is extremely risky. And to account for this difference, regulators take the so-called risk-weighted assets and would say, okay, government bonds, which are risk-free, have a risk weight of 0%, and subprime mortgage loans enter this calculation with a percentage and a weight of, say, 150%. And then you take all the assets, you calculate the risk-weighted assets, and then times 8%, and this is the amount of, regula of regulatory capital you need. And then in the second step, you look at your own liability side of the balance sheet, and you calculate the level of regulatory capital you actually hold. And if there's a mismatch between the necessary um, regulatory capital and the available regulatory capital, the supervisor, the regulator, will tell you that you are not fulfilling the capital requirements. Is that clear? Okay. And this is also, of course, this explains why um, if you are willing and if you are intending to decrease your regulatory capital, you will not simply sell off the government bonds. You will not sell off the risk-free um, instruments on your asset side, but you will try to decrease um, the instruments and the positions on your asset side with high risk weights. And this is usually, these are loans. The second instrument the supervisor regulator has at his uh, disposal is the assessment of an institution's liquidity. Um, we started this discussion by asking ourselves what causes a bank to default. And one of you said that, well, as a bank, the bank will default if it's not able to meet its obligations. Yes. And this is um, concerned, and this concerns a liquidity. Liquidity is uh, your ability to um, fulfill all current obligations and all current liabilities. So if, for example, you are required to pay back a bond, and the bond is due next week, 
Um, this is a current liability and you need to be able to pay back this money and if you're not able, you are in default. Quite simple. You need enough liquidity to fulfill all current um, obligations and if you are not, um, you're in immediate default. And this requires the supervisor or regulator to look at a bank's liquidity on a regular basis. And what will happen is that the regulator will ask the bank to uh, provide him and to supply um, measures of the bank's liquidity and of its liquidity risk. And if the supervisor is under the impression that the bank does not have enough liquidity or is not in full control of liquidity risk, the regulator and supervisor will step in and tell the bank, okay, you need to raise new liquidity. You need to fulfill your liquidity requirements. This is a little bit different from capital requirements because capital is much more long-term. Here it's just about cash and uh, assets that can be sold off in a uh, very quick way and the current liabilities. Then authorization of business operations. This is very interesting. In many countries, and especially in Germany, access to uh, financial markets is restricted, and especially access to banking and to access to the banking sector is restricted. You cannot simply pull up a shop and start giving out loans and calling yourself a bank uh, and uh, thinking that uh, the supervisor will allow this. Just as with uh, many other types of business, insurance, um, medical practice, etc., um, access to the sector is restricted. And this means that at first the regulator, the supervisor, actually this is the supervisor, the BaFin, um, needs to be asked whether you are allowed to open uh, a financial institutions, institution, whether you are allowed to act and to operate a financial institution. This is, this used to be quite boring because we had like 500, 600 banks in Germany. Um, in many cases, uh, these were extremely old uh, companies and the only direction the market was going to, uh, into was uh, some defaults and some mergers. So two existing banks merged and a bank defaulted and uh, did no longer exist. But um, access to market was not uh, an important question. However, there are now several developments that have caused this uh, instrument to be a little bit more interesting than it used to be. First, due to globalization, of course, many companies from outside the European Union and from other European um, countries have started to pour into Germany, just like with any other European country. And they want to operate as a bank and they want to uh, open shop here in Germany and they need to be licensed by BaFin, first thing. Secondly, of course, we now have several fintech startups and for many fintechs, it's a vital question whether they are a financial institution, whether they are regarded as a bank by BaFin, whether they are regarded as a financing company, whether they are actually no uh, company that is under the jurisdiction of BaFin. And this is nowadays quite interesting. A couple of years ago, when the first fintech started uh, to, um, to open, um, BaFin seemed to be quite conservative. And many startups tried uh, to circumvent the supervision of BaFin by, by a legal uh, uh, tricks, actually. Um, but this seems to work now. And with insurtechs and fintechs, they, they are, usually they are considered a bank or insurance company, or they team up with a smaller bank um, and they get their banking license from their uh, partner. So this is important. And also, uh, in many countries, the um, supervisor can allow or prohibit certain types of banking and financial business. And I, over the past two years, I've uh, told of this example, which I think is extremely uh, controversial. Uh, does anyone know what a CFD is? 
Have I heard of a CFD? Yes. What is a CFD? Uh, a little bit louder? Yeah, it's a com contract for difference. Yeah, and uh, what does it mean and what is so controversial about it? Try to make it simple. Yes. Leveraged or lever? Yeah. 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 In in simple terms, it's a highly levered financial derivative that is targeted towards the retail sector. And in some cases, uh, the, pot the loss potential is unlimited. So uh, you might buy it for 100 euros, but you might be unaware of the fact that you're required um, to um, accept unlimited losses, even beyond the 100 euros. And you have to uh, pay margin payments into your account and you have to make sure that you can cover losses that go into the thousands of euros and you can lose your whole property. Um, this is a market that is booming right now. And you can see this. Uh, first example, uh, I guess none of you has uh, seen this, but I usually uh, watch some YouTube videos uh, connected to financial markets and related to financial markets. Uh, and even if you have only watched a couple of lectures uh, on financial theory, YouTube uh, and the um, ad system behind uh, uh, YouTube will immediately change the ads that are shown to you. And in my case, I only get ad, uh, I only get ads for trading companies and online trading and uh, uh, the, the largest broker, the best broker for this and that, and they all want to uh, lure me into trading in CFDs. Okay, well, I can handle that. Uh, second example, it's even more controversial, I think. In my small hometown, um, which has a population of 50,000 people and is, has, severely, has been severely hit by um, the um, downfall of the coal and mining industry uh, in Western Germany. And nowadays has a population of, I think, 50,000 people, very high unemployment rate and uh, declining uh, city center, etc. So just a regular town in Western Germany, I think. Um, and a, one or two years ago, uh, a trading center opened in my hometown. A trading center, which is just a small shop uh, which large uh, window uh, 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 panels and uh, and this is actually quite interesting. They have like gambling uh, machines in there. Uh, you have a couple of TV screens where you have Bloomberg uh, running on a 24-7 loop. Uh, you have uh, trading machines where you can trade with CFDs and uh, uh, become a millionaire with a simple uh, uh, with some simple trading and a small investment. And you can actually watch the, um, the opening of this trading center on YouTube with a self-proclaimed uh, uh, trading guru who tells you uh, how easy it is to make uh, uh, some easy money on the stock market. And you only need to trade in CFDs and other fine financial derivatives. And this place looks like a gambling hall. It looks exactly like a gambling hall. Large, flashy machines, lots of lights. The only distinction and the only difference to a gambling hall is that a gambling hall in Germany is required to cover the windows so that children cannot look into the gambling hall, so that children who walk by the gambling hall are protected. This trading center does not have that. So it has never opened, I think. It was only open for a small time, and I'm still uh, waiting for BaFin and uh, other institutions and agencies to step in and to close this. They, I think they still operate on the internet. Uh, the shop has closed. So an idiotic business uh, model. I, I have no idea why they wanted to open the shop in my hometown. Um, but um, BaFin 
only a short time ago, I think uh, last year, BaFin uh, was authorized by the German federal government that it can also prohibit certain instruments. Before that, it was only allowed to prohibit certain types of business operations and to give out ba general banking licenses. But it was not allowed to tell, for example, Deutsche Bank uh, and to tell the whole financial sector, we are by now, starting now, we are prohibiting the trading of this financial derivative. This was not possible. Now, one or two years ago, BaFin was officially authorized to ban certain financial instruments to be traded in Germany. And this is something new. We've known this from the insurance sector. Do you know an example uh, where uh, certain types of uh, insurance are prohibited in Germany? Any idea? Yeah? I don't know about provision bars, what they change for provisions for life insurance. This is regular, this is regular, regular regulation, I would call it, yeah. There are some, as I've um, said earlier, um, BaFin is, only BaFin is responsible for the supervision of the insurance sector. Deutsche Bundesbank has some parts uh, and some departments that look at financial stability. You also look at insurance companies, but the supervision of the insurance sector is only uh, under the supervision of BaFin. And of course, they've changed some provisions over the last couple of years because life insurers are, doing, uh, are not doing well at the time. No, there are some life insurance products that are quite common uh, in the UK and I think in uh, the US and that are prohibited in Germany. And I think I might be wrong on that, but I think variable annuity products are prohibited in Germany. They're a band. Uh, because BaFin thinks that is not uh, a safe way for people um, to have their pension plan and uh, to have uh, some uh, money uh, when they are old. So this is um, banning products and banning financial instruments has been done before in, ins in the insurance sector, but this was not possible on the general financial market. And now for example, these products, the CFDs, with unlimited loss potential, they have already been banned by um, BaFin. And this is the authorization of business operations, uh, the uh, ominous banking license and bank license, but also uh, the ban on certain products and financial instruments. It can also monitor bank risk and individual transactions. I have told you this before. This is a very, uh, very German word. Gross Million Kredit Verordnung. Uh, this is the executive order concerning large and million, uh, million euro credits loans. And this is an executive order that uh, allows Deutsche Bundesbank, in this case it's Deutsche Bundesbank, to monitor extremely large loans given out by banks to other banks or other companies. And what is the intention behind this executive order? The supervisory agencies, Bundesbank and BaFin, want to be aware of large credit exposures. If, for example, Deutsche Bank gives out a loan of 500 million euros to Siemens, this is, of course, of interest to Bundesbank and BaFin because they want to know that if Siemens defaults, Deutsche Bundesbank suddenly has a credit exposure of 500 million euros. So if a loan gets too large, BaFin and Bundesbank want to be aware of this credit exposure. And this is the intention behind this uh, order um, on the large and million euro credits and loans. And Last but not least, um, of course, in addition to capital requirements, in addition to uh, liquidity supervision and access to um, the banking sector and monitoring large risks, they can also issue warnings, fines, they can ban certain instruments and they can withdraw licenses. If they are on the impression that a bank is um, unstable, uh, if a bank is uh, in um, 
in need of more capital and is not able to raise capital, it can withdraw the license um, and it will enter a process of controlled default. The BaFin and Bundesbank will try to uh, let go of this bank, of these financial institutions in a controlled manner. Um, why? Because they want to prevent uh, an uncontrolled default which would result in spillover effects because the financial market would suddenly be um, surprised. Do you know, uh, well, uh, no. Um, other question. Do you know how this is done with an insurance company? And this is one frequent argument uh, um, that is stated by insurance companies why insurance companies should not be as tightly and tough uh, and strongly regulated as banks. Yeah? Yes, another reason, when it comes to default. Yeah? Yeah? yeah they, uh, they get their repayment on a regular basis? Yes, yes. They're f um, they are more and better able to predict future cash flows because of premium payments, but also yeah, another reason. To, uh, yeah. I think my question is just it'll post. Um, what happens when a bank defaults? A bank will default, and the in an extreme scenario all deposits will be lost. This would mean that what happens now, uh, depositors will um, demand repayment, the bank is not able to repay the deposits, and other depositors at other banks might panic and run to their banks, and um, the problems at one bank will spill over to the rest of the banking sector. In the insurance sector, defaults happen very rarely, and also if an insurance company defaults, this, this is usually something the supervisor will notice well before it's too late. And in this case, the insurance supervisory agency, in this case also BaFin, will call for what is called a runoff. And you might have heard of this, um, one of the largest German insurers Ergo has recently decided to um, enter its life insurance into the runoff. What does it mean, runoff? Consider a life insurance company. What does a runoff mean? Hmm? Yeah, no, it's one, it's one um, resolution possibility to merge. But this is not what uh, runoff is. A runoff is a situation in which, take for example an insurance company that is not doing well and it's closing in on its default barrier, the supervisory agency will force the insurance company or the insurance management will decide on its own to enter runoff, to enter a runoff. And this will mean this means that the insurance company will stop doing new business. They will immediately stop selling new life insurance policies. And over the next 20 or 30 years, they will melt down, they will gradually melt down their balance sheet by paying out the policies they've already sold and trying to stabilize the company over the course of the next 10, 20, 30 years. So, in other words, this is something that, is, that resembles a bad bank. Yeah? You have uh, a, a company that is, um, not yet def uh, has not yet defaulted, but that is only left alive to pay out the remaining policies and you do not accept new business. But usually these runoffs are quite uh, um, satisfactory and the policyholders get their money back. 
and uh, the government might decide to um, to bail out a large insurance company but this long process of a runoff is one reason why usually um, you have no spillover effects in the insurance sector because okay one insurance company has a problem but the policyholders are usually safe and the process of slow decay and the, this process of the insurance company defaulting takes 20 30 years because life insurance policies have a duration and a maturity of 30 years so this is one reason why um, at least in the life insurance business spillover effects are quite rare okay now you have seen how regulation and supervision is done in Germany. Um, I want to um, give you an idea of what the US American banking system and supervision looks like. Um, we are also going to talk about some supranational banks like the BIS, Bank für Internationalen uh, Zahlungsverkehr, nein, Zahlungsausgleich, and uh, Bank for International Settlement. And I want to talk a little bit about these foreign banking sectors because this is one large part of banking research. If you want to study the effects of regulation and supervision, it is very um, instructional um, to look at the differences between um, several banking sectors and uh, national banking sectors. Because if you can observe that, for example, a certain type of uh, supervision works well in the US, and this is not doing so well and not working fine in, let's say, Spain, you can find some results from these differences. And uh, it's interesting to see, for example, how um, banking supervision is done differently in the US, in the UK, and in the European Union. For example, one example, in many countries, you have a static capital, minimum capital requirement. For example, 8% of all risk-weighted assets. In the UK, you have a dynamic system where the Bank of England will go to a bank, will look at the balance sheet of a bank, and will say, oh, you're this bank in 5%. And they will go to the next bank and they will say, okay, you have a different balance sheet, you have more risk-weighted assets, you need to fulfill a capital requirement of 7%. So this is different, um, different system. U.S. banking system, extremely interesting. Um, I would say that, actually, this is, yeah. Um, the start of banking supervision and bank uh, regulation uh, dates back to the time of the Civil War. Um, during the Civil War, um, in 1861 to 1865, um, or even before that, especially in banking, you can see um, the, the, the eternal problem and the eternal division that runs through the US. During the War of Independence, during the Revolutionary War, um, there was two main fractions, um, and it as with anything else, it's always about the question how much power should be given to the central federal government and how much power should be left with the federal states. It's the same with banking. And there was a controversial discussion uh, among the first uh, politicians of um, the US uh, when it came to founding a national bank. Um, because, of course, um, the question is whether the federal government should be able to have its own budget, to have a central bank, or whether the central banks of the states should take up uh, this responsibility in these tasks. Now, 70, uh, 80 years later in the Civil War, again, um, the Union states um, realized that um, the Confederate states were forging the money of the Union states to destabilize the Union economy. And do you know how this was actually possible? Um, the, you are aware of the Civil War, I presume? Yeah? yeah, Northern states, Southern states. The Southern states tried to, and they, they tried to destabilize the Northern economy by forging money. And this was extremely simple 
and easy. Why? The US had the dollar. They already had the US dollar as the national currency, but each bank was allowed to print its own money. You had different types of banknotes. They were all denominated in US dollars, but you had, for example, US dollars uh, issued by um, the National Bank in Illinois, uh, private banks, not state banks. And each federal state had a different banking act. And I might have mentioned this, that, for example, in some states, you only had one bank. Yeah, for example, I think in Iowa and Indiana, they, uh, in the 19th century, there was only one bank in the whole state of Iowa, or no, Ohio and Indiana. Uh, why? Because the, uh, the state governments believe that banking should not be left to the private sector and no private banks were allowed. This is also one reason why New York is now the financial hub of the US. Because at that time, New York, the state of New York, had the most, uh, the most lax uh, regulation on banking. And actually, it was also called the New York laws and the New York financial laws. So New York uh, deregulated the banking sector very early on in the 19th century uh, at a time in which some states prohibited private banking altogether. And all these banks were allowed to print their own banknotes. So you had um, a variety of banknotes, and this, of course, made it quite easy uh, for forgers to forge banknotes, because if, for example, you were a citizen living in Illinois, and you were suddenly given a, a banknote in US dollars from a bank in Vermont, you had no way in the 19th century to make sure that this uh, banknote uh, was counterfeit or not. And at that time, the US government, the, the federal government, realized that this system of each bank being allowed to um, print its own money in dollars was actually making it quite easy to uh, forge money. And at that time, uh, the green dollar banknotes were created. They were called greenbacks. And at that time, uh, it was actually um, um, uh, it had a negative connotation to it because uh, people believed that this, these banknotes issued by the federal government were not worth anything. So at that time, during the uh, Civil War, um, many things changed when it uh, comes to banking regulation. First, uh, the federal government uh, created the US Mint to print US dollars. Uh, so it uh, federalized uh, the issuance of uh, money. Second thing is, some of you might know that, um, at that time, um, shortly after uh, the Civil War, um, several agencies were formed. For example, the Secret Service was uh, created as a reaction to the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. And because of some other problems, the Secret Service is not only responsible for safeguarding politicians, I think it's also responsible for certain uh, tax evasion. And I think, no, it's responsible um, for uh, counterfeit money. Uh, and this is something usually people do not know. I think it's um, responsible for fighting counterfeit money. Okay. This chain, yeah? Uh, in German, it's uh, Falschgeld. Counterfeit money is uh, if, for example, I take a piece of paper and I try to forge money. Yeah? It's a type of uh, fraud. No? At that time, many things changed. And the first agencies were created to regulate banking and to regulate the financial market. At the start of the 20th century, the next problem came. Um, companies issued shares, and the same problems as with the banknotes also happened with stocks. Companies issued shares, and there were many people who tried to defraud uh, investors by selling them uh, false shares. Uh, because there was no way, and this whole, the whole stock exchange was not regulated, uh, people, especially in the Midwest, uh, found it quite easy uh, to defraud um, people and investors by selling them um, counterfeit shares uh, 
shares of companies that did not exist, uh, exist. And at that time, the federal government again realized it had to regulate this market and the Securities and Exchange Commission was formed, the SEC, to regulate access to the stock market. And then afterwards, Great Depression, as a reaction to the Great Depression in which many banks defaulted, um, the so-called Glass-Steagall Act was uh, instituted and installed. Glass-Steagall called for a clear separation of commercial and investment banking. Glass-Steagall was repealed um, by Graham Leach Bliley, the Graham Leach Bliley Act in 1999. Um, this is part of the deregulation of the Clinton administration in which uh, the financial market and especially the banking sector was deregulated. Uh, it allowed banks um, to operate both commercial banking and investment banking divisions. And after this, banks merged. Uh, Bank of America, Citigroup and all these large banks were rather small in the 90s and they grew exponentially in size after Graham Leach Bliley. Now, after that, we had the financial crisis, and nowadays we have the Dodd-Frank Act. Dodd -Frank, uh, the Dodd-Frank Act uh, called for tougher regulation on banks. Trump now uh, thinks is uh, thinking about repealing certain parts of Dodd-Frank, and it's Right now, it's quite difficult to tell whether the US banking system is, uh, is uh, a separate banking system or universal banking system. In 2006, for example, this uh, uh, textbook in German uh, by Hartmann, Wendels, Pfingsten, Weber, they still spoke of uh, the German banking sector, you know, the US banking sector as a separate banking sector, which is definitely not true. What types of banks do you have in the US? You have commercial banks, you have so-called thrift institutions uh, consisting of savings and loan associations, credit unions and mutual savings banks, and you have investment banks, brokers, dealers and other non-banks or near banks, this is sometimes also the shadow banking sector, but this is more or less the, the these are the most important types. Commercial banks, private commercial banks, investment banks, brokers, stockbrokers, and stock dealers, and thrift institutions. What are thrift institutions? Have you ever seen a thrift store in the US? There you might know what thrift means. These are cooperative banks just like the cooperative banks in Germany, the Volks- und Raiffeisenbanken, the Genossenschaftliche Banken, those are cooperatives, um, which are, of course, different from private commercial banks due to their legal form. And you can see that you have mutual savings banks, credit unions, savings and loan associations. So this is more or less what in Germany Sparkassen and Volksbanken are. So these are the... Um, banks that um, operate in a cooperative legal form. Okay, so commercial banks, uh, the most important large ones are of course Bank of America and Citigroup. These are the largest ones and over the last couple of decades we've seen a, an immense consolidation wave among these commercial banks and they've Usually they just merge, merge, and merge because uh, they try to um, raise synergies and to profit from synergy effects. Because uh, of course banking is much more uh, um, is well much nicer, not but it's uh, more profitable and it decreases risk by diversification if you increase in size, if you increase your size. Thrift institutions in German. These are the spa. Darlins, Kassen, Sparkassen, with one distinction and one difference, usually you do not have many state and government owned banks. In Germany, the Sparkassen, the savings and loan associations are government owned. Here in the US, usually you don't have too many government owned banks. This is very, this is very common in, in Europe, I think. These are the second, they form the second big group of banks. Uh, they include mutual savings banks. Those can mainly be found in New England, 
uh, you have savings and loan associations as well as credit unions. And similar to the German savings banks and cooperative banks, they are usually in the possession of the depositors or customers, just like mutual insurers uh, are in the possession of the policyholders. Okay, and of course they operate on a smaller scale and at a local level. So if you uh, drive through the US, you will probably see a lot of small regional and local banks. The savings and loan associations actually suffered quite heavily during the 80s in a crisis that was given a name uh, based on the savings and loan associations. It's a savings and loan crisis, the SNL crisis. This was a crisis between 86 and 95, during which approximately one third of all savings and loan associations and all savings banks went bankrupt. And what caused this crisis? Uh, it's quite funny to see that uh, the timeline of events looks quite similar to the timeline of the financial crisis because, it's, because it starts with deregulation. It started with the deregulation by the Depository Institutions Deregulation and Monetary Control Act. And this was the permission to offer additional financial products without any change in the regulation of banks. Then came the Tax Reform Act of 86 under Ronald Reagan, and this eliminated tax rebates for real estate investments, and the result was that uh, real estate values fell and depreciation uh, followed at the uh, savings banks, because savings banks financed all those mortgage loans. They gave out mortgage loans, again mortgage loans, just like in the financial crisis. And because the prices, the house prices deteriorated, banks had to uh, write off their loans. Then, same thing just like in the financial crisis, interest, rate, uh, interest rates uh, rose because uh, the US government tried to fight inflation. Uh, this caused an increase in the refinancing costs and of course if you have to write off on your mortgage loans on the right hand side and if you have to pay higher interest rates uh, and of course especially these small regional banks lacked in diversification because they only had mortgage loans in one small geographical area where all the house prices uh, deteriorated um, they got into trouble. And 1,000 of these 3,000 savings banks defaulted over a period of almost 10 years. So you, if you just take this SNL crisis, you could just say, okay, the financial crisis of 2008, 2009 was just the SNL crisis reloaded much quicker on a global scale. The same, ta same timeline of events. Uh, deregulation, higher risk taken by banks, uh, then a sudden macroeconomic shock, shock uh, in the form of an increase in interest rates. Banks can no longer guarantee their financing and uh, have uh, uh, depreciation uh, to suffer, and then they default. Okay. Implications, approximately 160 billion US dollars of damage to the public sector and to investors. And speak of pro-cyclical regulation, uh, the government stepped in and it formed the Office of Thrift Supervision, the OTS, for the supervision of thrift institutions, because this was a problem of the local uh, thrift institutions. It created the Savings Association Insurance Funds for deposit insurance and the Resolution Trust Corporation for a controlled resolution of distressed banks. Thrift institutions, private commercial banks, next investment banks. Group of investment banks comprises US-based investment banks and foreign investment banks operating there. And examples are, of course, Goldman Sachs, Mong Stanley, JP Morgan. Um, one has to say that most of these investment banks nowadays operate under a universal banking license and are not uh, investment banks per se, but do you know why they are, uh, they were quite happy to um, become a commercial bank legally? Because after the financial crisis, uh, 
uh, government aids were only given out to commercial banks, but not to investment banks. So suddenly all the large investment banks were happy uh, to get a full li a banking license and to act as a universal bank and suddenly they all became universal banks and commercial banks so that they were able to get uh, government aids under the TARP program. In addition, you have securities brokers and securities dealers. The former trade in securities without, whereas the latter trade with own holdings and brokers live on the commissions and dealers live on exploiting the bid ask spreads in the securities they trade in. Okay. Non-banks and near banks, pension funds, mutual funds, money market funds, those are financial institutions that officially are not banks, but at some point they are offering some sort of banking service. So they are considered to be near banks or non-banks. Also, sometimes we call it shadow banking. What is shadow banking? A shadow bank is a financial institution that acts as a bank, but for legal reasons is not considered as and is not supervised like a bank. And this is highly controversial and problematic, of course, because if a money, money market fund or a hedge fund is acting as a bank, but is not regulated and not supervised, uh, this is one of the reasons we had so such large problems during the financial crisis because supervisors were not aware of the problems that have uh, that were amassed at shadow banks, especially money, money market funds. And suddenly money market funds withdrew liquidity from other banks, so they were acting as other banks in the interbank sector, um, but they were not regulated and regulators were not aware of uh, these mechanisms. It's not illegal, and it used, uh, it used to be legal, but during the financial crisis, of course, banks have now, uh, regulators have now stepped in and have made it clear that if you offer certain uh, services, you are considered to be a bank. Some examples and some characteristics, usually hedge funds, ETFs, they are uh, viewed as shadow banks. They do not finance themselves through deposits because if they accepted deposits, well, regulators would immediately see that you are a bank and they would be regulated as a bank. They are not subject to the usual regulation of banks and this is what we call regulatory arbitrage. Regulatory arbitrage means that you exploit differences and loopholes in regulation uh, to earn money and to make higher profits. This is what we call regulatory arbitrage. This can be done, for example, in one country where you uh, act as a bank, but you uh, exploit a loophole in regulation and you're not regulated as a bank. Or you can also exploit it on a, on a national level, on a global level, for example, by shifting business from one country to another country where it's not regulated. Um, a very simple example is, for example, to open um, to open uh, a headquarters on the Isle of Man, on Jersey, on the Channel Islands, on the Bermuda Islands, uh, so that you officially you're considered to be a bank or insurance company located uh, in the Bermuda Islands, in Bermuda Islands, um, but of course you're doing business in the US. This is regulatory arbitrage. You're shifting your official headquarters or you're shifting some business to other countries to exploit different uh, regulations. Yeah. One problem is you have no access to central bank money uh, or guarantees by the state and this caused some money market funds to derail during the financial crisis. So this is the lack of transparency, inadequate regulation, excessive leverage. Uh, this is what causes problems when it comes to shadow banking. When thinking of US banks, uh, I've already told you that uh, historically uh, state, states regulated banks. And due to several developments during the course of history in the US, the federal government has stepped in and taken over some uh, form of uh, a responsibility for banks. And due to this, you now have so-called state banks and state chartered banks, which means that these banks, 
have, their, have been chartered and have been licensed by a federal state, for example, Minnesota, Illinois, California. And even in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, uh, you were under the uh, legislation and under regulation of the state. And this meant that, for example, if the state of California had laws in place that said state banks are not allowed to operate without, uh, um, uh, um, um, not without, but uh, in uh, outside the state of California, you were only allowed to do business in California. You were not allowed to open a branch in, say, Wisconsin. These bank branch regulation laws have been abolished and were abolished in the 70s, 80s and 90s. But back then, um, it was important for state banks, for example, and also federal banks, that um, you could not open branches in any US state. This is a state chartered bank. And you can recognize this if you see, for example, state bank of blah, 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 the state bank of la, la, la. Huh? First State Bank of Illinois or First Illinois Bank. This means that you're a state chartered bank. You also have, uh, compared to this, you have also federally chartered banks. This means that you are chartered on the federal level, that you have been chartered by a federal authority. State banks are authorized and supervised by a state. National banks, federal savings banks, they are authorized and supervised by the Federal Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, the OCC. This is an important distinction. And if you take any random bank, you can immediately tell whether it's a state chartered or federally chartered bank. If you see, for example, First National, it's a national chartered bank, nationally chartered bank. If you have uh, First State Bank of Illinois, it's a state chartered bank. And it's different when it comes to regulation and supervision. State banks that are members of the Federal Reserve System are additionally supervised by the Fed. State banks that are not members of the Federal Reserve are supervised by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. And this is what is called the dual banking system. All banks are supervised at the state level and at the federal level. And at some point, the federal government said, OK, the states cannot supervise all banks on their own. We need to have two levels, a state level and a federal level. And federal, ch federally chartered banks are, of course, supervised by the OCC. And state banks can choose whether they are, want to be uh, supervised by the FDIC or the Fed. Also, quite interesting, in the US, the Federal Reserve System, the national central bank of the US, is not just one simple bank, but the central bank, go back to uh, the time before the Civil War, uh, remember that all banks were allowed to print their own banknotes, and this shows you that the idea in the US of a central bank was actually to have all banks come together in one system to form the central bank. And here, it's interesting to see that the Federal Reserve System is not just simply the Federal Reserve. Um, it's the Federal Reserve Banks. And I think we'll see uh, how many Federal Reserve Banks we have. I think it's seven. And all the banks that have opted to be a part of the Federal Reserve System. So for example, a private bank can be part of the Federal Reserve System. This is yeah, 12 regional banks. These are the Federal Reserve Banks. Do you know some examples? The Federal Reserve Bank of? Most important one is? California? No. New York. New York. It's, uh, I only know the Latin word, primus inter pares. Uh, it's the, the most important one and the leading Federal Reserve Bank among equals. Most of the regulation, most of the research, uh, and most um, plans for the whole Federal Reserve System are laid out by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York because it's the most, it's the largest one, it's the most important one because, well, Wall Street and most of the financial sector is located in New York. Federal Reserve Bank of uh, New York, Atlanta, uh, I think Kansas City, uh, there's one in 
San Francisco, and so on. So we have 12 regional Federal Reserve Banks, the Federal Reserve Board in Washington. And when you think of the chairman of the Fed, you think of the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board in Washington, who, supervise, who consists, of course, of all the uh, presidents of these uh, single Federal Reserve Banks. And the member banks, <coughs> national banks must be members of the Fed system. State banks can choose to become members of the Federal Reserve System. And in addition, it functions as a central bank. It supervises and regulates all member banks. And this is almost one third of all banks. And this is very different, for example, to the uh, supervisory process in Germany. Here, the Federal Reserve Bank, the central bank, is the supervisory agency for only one third of all banks. The OCC is the supervisory and regulatory authority for all national banks and thrift super uh, institutions. And the FDIC is the Federal Deposit Insurance uh, Corporation, so it's the Deposit Insurance Fund. And in the event of insolvency, the deposits of the customers of the member banks are secured by the FDIC. In addition, the FDIC supervises state banks that are not part of the SES Fed system. So these are usually uh, commercial private banks because the credit unions are insured by the National Credit Union Administration. The US banking sector is extremely large. It's the largest banking uh, system in the world. And this explains why you have so many different supervisory authorities who take up different duties and have different tasks. FDIC, this is also very strange for us in Germany, the Deposit Insurance Fund is also responsible for the supervision of a fraction of the banks in the banking system. If you take a random bank in the US, you can immediately see that it's FDIC insured because they usually uh, advertise this. You can see blah, 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 bank of blah, 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 and you have a small sign somewhere on the window pane. It says FDIC, a member of the FDIC, uh, to tell you that your deposits are safe. Why? Because, well, the US have made uh, some bad uh, experience, have some bad experiences in their history that people and depositors uh, lost all of their money. So they are quite uh, sensitive when it comes to the safety of deposits. This is why banks um, who are insured in the FDIC, they advertise this. The SEC is responsible for investment banks and the stock exchanges. Okay. We have some supranational banks, and we will talk about this next week, I think. Do we have any questions? Anything you want to discuss about the US banking sector? You have the OCC, FDIC, FED. One last thing. Do you have an idea how the supervision of the insurance sector looks like? I haven't talked about insurance companies. Investment banks, SEC. Brokers, dealers, stock exchanges, SEC. Banks, OCC, FDIC, Federal Reserve. And state banking authorities and supervisory agencies. But what about insurance companies? Does anyone know? Yeah? You have regulation only at the state level. There is no federal or used to be no federal regulation of insurance, the insurance sector in the US. It was all at the state level. So each state has its own insurance commissioner. For historical reasons, usually they are insurance uh, commissioners. They are all organized in the NAIC. The national, I think, National Association of Insurance Commissioners and all the insurance commissioners, the supervisors from Illinois, from Alaska, from Indiana, from California, they all join uh, and have meetings in the National Association of Insurance uh, uh, Commissioners. But this organization, this association has no power. They only meet to discuss some aspects of their supervision and to coordinate supervision so that the supervision uh, of the insurance sector 
is done more or less the same in the same way uh, in all states. But they do not have to do this. And this is why some states have attracted almost all insurance companies. And in fact, most insurance, US insurance companies are actually located in Bermuda, in the Bermuda Islands. But there are some states where you have many insurance companies and you have some states where you have maybe a handful of small insurance companies. And I guess the office of the insurance commissioner uh, consists of 10 people working there. It's very small because some states, some for, take for example some states in the Midwest, they have a population of 500,000 people uh, and they will have uh, only a bunch of insurance policies. So you don't need too much supervision there. Insurance supervision is done at the state level. Okay. If you have no questions, then thanks for the attention and see you next week.